Welcome to our second lecture of Intro to World Religions. I would like to look at uh, two things today. We're going to look at this question of what is religion. And we're ultimately, we're going to learn the definition we're going to use in this class. And, uh, and we're going to begin just, uh, just uh, begin the surface of our, uh, our journey into Hinduism. Uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the personalities you met in your homework. So first, your homework was to answer the question, to give some thought to what is religion. And, and I, only, I only wish we were together, because if we were together, you would, I would be uh, calling on you. I probably would have even asked you to have written it out. Uh, it's usually my first homework assignment, and uh, I like to collect it and use it as a first impression. But um, uh, that, be as that may, uh, I hope you gave it some thought. And so I'm just going to guess from past experience, interactions in class, I'm going to play both roles, so to speak. I'm going to say that uh, many of you might have written that it uh, uh, addresses a belief in God, that, uh, that the word God would be in some of your definitions. Uh, uh, Religion is the following of God, the belief in God. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is fairly common, especially in the West, because most of you have been raised in a uh, uh, Judeo-Christian uh, uh, background. And so it is very God-centered. And that's a little bit of our bias, as if, uh, if that's what our religion is about, then that must be what religion is about. Uh, your bias is not uh, uh, just yours. Uh, I'm going to share a few definitions of religion. Uh, and, and one of them is, uh, is from uh, a professor of cultural anthropology who basically says exactly that. It is the belief in spiritual beings. A, a, a generic term for God, uh, or even gods or goddesses. And so uh, that's a simple definition might even be close to some of the ones you came up with. Let me give you a, uh, let, me, let me just tell you that what we're talking about is actually somewhat complicated. People will make it complicated. And that is that uh, here is a definition from a, uh, another, uh, uh, this is a professor of symbolic anthropology who writes, without further ado then, a religion is one, a system of symbols which acts to, number two, establish powerful, pervasive, and long-lasting moods and motivations in men by, three, formulating conceptions of a general order of existence, and four, clothing these conceptions with such an aura of factuality that, five, the moods and motivations seem uniquely realistic. That is a mouthful. <laughs> that is the, you do not have to memorize that. You don't even have to have written that down. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a mouthful. Uh, here's one from a, a professor of sociology and religion. Um, Religion is the human attitude towards a sacred order that includes within it all being, human or otherwise, that is belief in a cosmos, the meaning of which both includes and transcends humanity. Interesting. Begin to note that other than the first one I gave you, which talked about spiritual beings, many of these and their professors uh, 
aren't really going to God. They're almost skirting the issue of God. Uh, let me give you, this is a professor from Berkeley. Uh, a set of symbolic forms and acts which relate man to the ultimate conditions of his existence. I apologize for the male domination in that definition. This is uh, someone uh, from 1927, so uh, uh, that's part of what we're dealing with. Um, uh, here is one from a, uh, a satirist. Uh, his name is Ambrose Bierce. Uh, this is, he, he says that religion is a daughter of hope and fear, explaining to ignorance the nature of the unknowable. Kind of cute. Of course, this is also the man that's known for uh, defining love as uh, an affliction curable by marriage. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's his satire. Um, uh, here is one. Here is one that I don't even know what to say about. And some of you are going to go into psychology. This is Sigmund Freud's definition of religion. Religious beliefs correspond closely with the fantasies of infantile life, mainly unconscious ones concerning the sexual life of one's parents and the conflicts this gives rise to. Whoa. <laughs> We are not going there. I'm telling you that right now. We're not going there. Uh, basically, here's, here's, here's the point I want to make. It's hard to define. It's been hard to define. So let's uh, give you a demonstration. Give you a demonstration. I'm going to show you a red ball. A red ball. I am going to take this red ball and place it into this hand. Now, not exactly a professional magician. I'm gonna put it into that hand and I'm going to make it go from that hand to this pocket. It's a great trick. I love this trick. Ready? Abracadabra. Did you see it go? Huh. It's not in that hand. Didn't you see it go into this pocket? Now, that is a great magic trick, right? This is, this is a, a trick. Look, look, let me just tell you that magicians do not do their tricks twice because they don't want you to catch on, right? But I just think this trick is so incredible that I, in case you missed it, I, just, I want to do it again for you. I just, I, I love this trick. Uh, I'm gonna take the red ball and I am going to put it into this hand. Now, I'm gonna put it, I mean, I know, I just I do my best. I'm gonna put it in that hand. I'm gonna make it go from that hand to this pocket. I appreciate the fact that you're all being very respectful right now. Uh, uh, ready, it's gonna, it's gonna go. One, two, three. Did you see it go? Abracadabra, it went. Yes, no, maybe. I know if you were sitting there, you'd have called my attention to the fact that you could see it. I, I apologize for that, you know, but, but that's not a red ball. That's a red cube. What happened to the red ball? Is it in that hand? That's a black ball in that hand. What happened to the red ball? 
Didn't you see it go into this pocket? Now, I appreciate the applaud. I, you're, you're not applauding. I, I, you're not here. <laughs> that is, this is, I thrive on the attention, but uh, uh, let's just say, uh, what was that all about? We're adult. You know, when you were a child, magicians, whoa, magic, you know, a rabbit in a hat. The, you know, we're getting older. It's a pretty good trick. I'd like to think it's a pretty good trick. But what do we think? We really think, you know, some of you are probably thinking, you know, how I did it. Yeah, I was squeezed up. It's a sponge ball. Somehow I made it look, I don't know. Just so you know, you can't make a, you can't make a cube look like a ball. You just, you can't. So, so, uh, just think twice about that. You're trying to figure out how I did it. Because for the most part, you know, it's a trick. Here's my take on it. There's more going on than meets the eye. I think most of you are pretty sure of that. Now let's talk about religion. This is the idea, right? There's more going on than meets the eye, we think. Look, there are a lot of things in this life we don't know. We look around at an incredible world. We really want to know how the magician does it. This is like, we, we want to know where it came from. We want, is there a magician? These are some of the big questions. Really, literally, some of the mysteries. The mysteries. Now, just so you know, as an incentive to sticking it out in this class. If you stick around in the very last lecture, I will tell you how I did that trick, but you're gonna have to think about it for the whole semester, just so you know, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, if we were in class together, this is one of those interactive moments. I would ask you, I have asked every one of my classes, what don't we know? What would we like to know? What are some of the questions religion attempts to at answer for us? And if I ask you what are the mysteries, I'm, I'm confident all I, can do, all I can do today is give you the answers. I get the same answers in every class. <laughs> you don't, don't think you're so, you're so uh, uh, special. The answers come up over and over again. What are the questions? The mysteries. The mysteries. The mysteries of life. What are they? One might be someone, but I would call on someone. They would say, uh, uh, who are we? Who are we? Are we just uh, collections of atoms and molecules? Is uh, We feel like more than that. In our essence, who are we? Why are we here? Another good one. Why are we here? What is the purpose of life? What's this place all about? Why has it gone to so much trouble to bring us here? What are we doing here? What's the purpose? What's the meaning? How did it all get started? Another good one. How did it start? creation question. Where did all this come from? Was there a first cause? Was it created by someone? 
How did it all get started? Another big question. Here's a really big one. Thank you for asking. Where are we going? Are we going anywhere? What happens next? What happens after this life? What is death about? It awaits all of us. I hope that's not bad news. This consumes many people. Where are we going? These are the mysteries. What, what, what else do we have? We have uh, issues like um, are we going to get punished? Is there a judgment? Does the judgment have anything to do with where we're going? Are there options? What happens? Things like, uh, uh, here's a big one. I don't always get this one. It's a little trickier. The question of, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? One of the most challenging aspects of that question. Childhood illness, children suffering. What did they do to deserve it? What is this place all about? These are some of the questions, some of the mysteries. Is anyone in charge? Anyone in charge? Do we hold our own destiny in our hands or is it predetermined? Fate versus free will. These are, we don't know these answers. Science is working on some, there's some, some takes on how it got started. We're clearly learning more and more about who we are in terms of DNA and uh, uh, the genetic code. There's a lot we don't know. There is a lot we don't know. And here's the point. No one knows. I said in the last lecture, this is a class about belief. This is not a class about truth or proof or, I mean, if we had these answers, we wouldn't need to believe something that someone else believes something different about. This is what makes it belief. In fact, you could say all religion is opinion. It's each group's opinion of what these answers are. Many groups will promote their opinion in absolute terminology. Like this is the way it is. This is the way it happened. This is what we know. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next class when we talk about source of knowledge, source of scripture.
Where does it come from? What is its claim to correctness, to truth? The mysteries. How does the magician do it? How did all of this get here? How did you get here? These mysteries. You know, you can try and go through life and ignore them. You can try and go through life and not pay attention to them. Get lost in your daily work and your pursuit of, of a job and happiness and try and ignore them. But I have to tell you, they will hunt you down. You are going to lose people you care about. You are going to not think it's fair. You are going to wonder why. These are universal questions that do not have accepted, agreed upon, unified answers. Certainly not yet. Which leads me to the definition of religion we will be using in this class. Now, disclaimer time again. This is not a universally accepted definition of religion. I read a number of them to you. They are well respected. Just no one agreed upon definition. So know that this is the religion for this class. This is basically my definition of religion. It's my ball. This is the definition you need to know for this class. I personally think it's workable. <laughs> I personally think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's got a message associated with it. This is need to know stuff. What is the definition we will, we will use? The definition has four parts. The structure within which the structure within which religion religion has a structure there's a there's an organization there's a you know notice unspecified structure but a structure it could be a culture it could be a community be a club. Sometimes I like to joke that uh, religion is a club mentality and my club is better than your club and my club has a secret handshake and my club be, and my clubhouse is nicer than your clubhouse. <laughs> we, we, this is this plays out in the religion uh, in the religion uh, arena. Unspecified, but it has a structure. The structure within which one can, one can. Notice I used the word can. I did not use the word will, or I didn't even use the word should. Could works, but it's related to can. One can develop a relationship a relationship we are in relation we're in relation to each other we're in relation to our planet we develop a relationship through this structure maybe that's the can part with the 
mysteries of life. The mysteries of life, the relationship, perhaps, brought to us through a structure. The mysteries of life is our big euphemism in this class. Can mean God. Can mean the divine. Can mean everything we don't know. It's our relationship with these questions. This is what unites us in this class. This is what allows us to teach it in a secular university. Like Ninian Smart paved the way for, I mentioned him in the last lecture, Mysteries of Life. Now, this is our definition. Remember that definition, one of the ones I read you had that one, two, three, four, five parts and uh, actually Ninian Smart, that professor that uh, uh, the pioneer of teaching religion in secular universities, he's got a seven part definition that I didn't even bother reading to you because it's the whole first chapter of, our, uh, of, of one of the introduction books. Uh, uh, oof, it's really complicated. But I need to go there. I need to go there so that you understand what I would like to call the pillars on which this structure is based upon. The pillars. So religion has what I call three plus one pillars by which it's organized on which it stands. The three plus one pillars. The first, knowledge. You see, every religion we're going to look at has a body of knowledge, a set of books, scriptures, uh, uh, stories. It's a knowledge base that they are asking you to acquire, to read, to, to, to learn from. There is a knowledge base. It is one of the pillars. They all have them. They also have a pillar that I would call devotion or the dues the things you're expected to do in your religion. Most often they, they relate to aspects of devotion, uh, how you are to relate to objects of devotion or people that we devote ourselves to, even the teachings. So there are the do's, one of which may be to read the knowledge, maybe one of which would be to go to church, to go to a worship service, to do the devotion work, to honor the holidays, celebrate the holidays. There is always stuff to be done in religion. And finally, at least for the first three, there are the beliefs. What you're expected to believe. Sometimes this is where their doctrine or their dogma is, is, is located. Their answers to these mysteries. The Bible is the word of God. So some, their beliefs, belief in one God, Monotheism, belief in gods or goddesses, polytheism, beliefs, things you're asked to accept. 
sometimes going so far as to say as truth as the truth these are the beliefs these are the pillars how much religion stands notice I said three plus one what is the plus one there is a fourth pillar with regard to religion and that's that it has an institutional pillar I put it down below I keep it somewhat separate for a reason uh, institution the structural part the uh, who's who's ordained what what does it mean to be a teacher of it who who represents the religion where do you meet can be the 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 uh, building and the maintenance of the building there's an institutional component these are the pillars if we took Ninian smart seven pillars I would show you how they fit this is plenty this is plenty this works but I want to ask you one other question I had you think about what is religion Now that we've come to some, hopefully, agreement, better be agreement <laughs> for this class anyway. <laughs> if this is religion, what's spirituality? This is that other word, spirituality. What is spirituality, if that's what religion is? And, and basically, if you were here, I would ask you, and you would give me some feedback. And, and truthfully, we usually are pretty good about this one. Someone will give me an answer that spirituality is personal. This is one of the first things people would might say. And I would tell you that's, that's a great point. It's personal. It's, it's a personal experience. In fact, what I would tell you is that for spirituality, hopefully I'm still in the picture over here. I believe I am. Spirituality becomes basically there's no structure. Spirituality is simply the personal experience. Experience of a relationship. If you're going to experience something, there must be a, an element you are in relation to, in relation to a feeling, in relation to a, 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 an experience. The personal experience of a relationship with the mysteries. The mysteries of life. No group involved. Perhaps you received it in a group. Understand something. Its goal is a, a relationship with the mysteries, but notice the word can. There's no guarantee here. So, sorry for that glitch uh, and the glitch of the glitch. Um, uh, it's like battery problem, so we're back on. And... Uh, I was talking about the difference between spirituality and religion, that spirituality is personal. It is the personal experience of it. And as a result, I want to share the fact that I even believe there are three pillars of spirituality. And they are related to the pillars of religion. 
but not quite the same. Here's the deal. These pillars are all outside of you. You acquire the knowledge that the religion is offering you. You acquire the, uh, the instructions on how to do the practices. You acquire the beliefs. It is something that someone gives you to believe in, perhaps like a nice fuzzy uh, uh, tent that you get to crawl into and then ignore what else is outside of it. Whereas when we turn to spirituality, it is more personal. Instead of knowledge, and I like to say that just like spirituality can, this word can, lead to spiritual experiences. In fact, you might say that in its idealized form, religion's purpose is to bring you to spiritual experiences, to, the, to, a, to an, a, 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 a realization of more going on than meets the eye, a feeling for it, an appreciation for it, an experience of it. And, and so, these pillars can lead to the three pillars of spirituality. And the three pillars. So what would we say would be equivalent to knowledge, but found inside of ourselves? And I would ask you, and maybe some of you would guess, but I, I won't. Clearly, I'm not putting you on the spot. My point is, it's wisdom. Ideally, knowledge is leading us to wisdom. But no guarantees. No guarantees. People can learn a lot and not understand it at all not incorporated into their life, not understand the meaning behind it. Wisdom is found inside. Wisdom. Wisdom is related to perspective. Wisdom is related to sight. We say the eye of wisdom. You carry it in your pocket. It's on every dollar bill in your pocket. On the pyramid at the top is the eye. It's the eye of wisdom. Wisdom is how clearly you see. It's not what you know. It's perspective. It's clarity. Understanding. Wisdom. Found inside. A pillar of spirituality. And what might correspond to devotion? Devotion to a person or a group or a, a relics or outside of us. What turns on inside? What can devotion lead us to? I suggest it's love. Love. Love is a light we light inside of ourselves. Love is, love is magical. It's magical. We'll talk more about it. Your video homework today was about loving yourself. Ram Dass's insight was what it takes to accept yourself. Love. Love is inside. Ideally, devotion can teach you and take you to love. But there's no guarantee. And I want to suggest that beliefs, there is a distinction I make here, that belief can, in idealized forms, lead to faith. Faith. 
Faith involves trust. Faith is not... We, we, have, we have faith. Faith actually comes... The word fa... The entomology of the word faith is the word to let go. To let go of knowing. When you have faith, you have, a, you have trust. Trust that it's the way it's supposed to be. You don't just believe in God, you trust in God. There is a difference. There is a difference in terms of how that feels. That is a light that turns on inside of us that belief can lead to. These are the three pillars of spirituality. Notice there is no plus one. That's why I call this three plus one. There is no institutional pillar for spirituality. It's personal. There's no structure there. This is the form the construction, this is the, this, this is the model that we're going to be using in this class. We will look at each of the religions we are studying and we will see where they fit into these pillars, what their knowledge base is, what you have to do for each of them, all of these pillars. At the end of every religion we look at, we'll plug it in, it'll be our a form of our summary, our understanding, the understanding that we can take away, and an understanding of what they're trying to take us to. So this is the definition of religion. And now it is time to begin begin our first religion. To begin to look at, we're going to start with Hinduism. Hinduism. What? Let's talk about the order we're taking them in. Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Basically, historical order. You'll see how that plays in. Uh, there are some claims that Judaism is, 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 the, is old. Uh, uh, you'll, see how that, you'll see how that happens. Uh, uh, you'll learn how Judaism and Christianity, for the most part, develop together, which means we're starting in, in, in zero. Uh, uh, Hinduism goes back, we're going back to 1500 B.C. We're going back to scriptures written 3,500 years ago. And here's what I want to say as we get ready to embark on Hinduism. I want to warn you. I want to caution you that whatever you know about Hinduism, perhaps you have encountered Hindu gods or goddesses. Some of the caricatures, some of the paintings of gods and goddesses in Hinduism. And perhaps you've dismissed it. Perhaps it looks like they look like cartoon characters. And I have to tell you, as we start here, you need to understand that this is one of the most sophisticated and complex religions, philosophies of philosophy of religion that exists on this planet today. We are talking about teachings 3,500 years old that include literally atomic theory conservation of matter and energy, theories of consciousness, 
philosophies of form and matter. Big Bang Theory. We're, we're not talking about a simplistic creation story. We're talking about Big Bang Theory. The, uh, descriptions of the start of our universe that come closer to what scientists are discovering today than any other religion on this planet. Theories of evolution from 3,500 years ago. Left brain, right brain work. This is embedded in teachings from 1500 BC. Here's kind of my take on it, just, just in advance of our really delving in. It's complicated. There's a lot of complicated stuff here. Perhaps you even saw some of it in your homework. When you listened to Ram Das, Swami Satchidananda a little clearer. When you listen to Ram Das, and boy, he, can, he is clever. And he is talking about literally Hindu religious concepts of who you are and what we're doing here. Concepts of the divine, part of what you heard. I'm going to explain who he is in a moment. I simply want to say that one of the problems that Hinduism has, has addressed as well as it could 3,500 years ago is that my take is that it is such a complex philosophy that hardly anyone understood it back then. Certainly, common people, illiterate, look, we're going to be looking at history. Most people throughout history have been illiterate. It's only a select few that have been able to read and write. A lot of oral teachings. A lot of explanations, a lot of stories. Hinduism is full of stories. This is what, you take a complex issue. You have been, you're familiar with this. Who did you grow up with as a child? What, what models of behavior? I'm, I'm going to have a little trouble relating to perhaps your generation. In my generation, it was Mickey Mouse. And, and Disney. And you've got Star Wars and, and, uh, and, and models of good and evil played out in, in characters that you revere and honor and, and love. That's what's going on in Hinduism. Complex issues. What, what did we have? Jiminy Cricket for a conscience. This was, was the, uh, was, uh, that was Walt Disney's uh, uh, metaphor. In Hinduism, these are stories attempting to embody what are sophisticated and difficult concepts to understand. And so made simpler in a form they can relate to. These characters in Hinduism are as, are as uh, uh, loved and revered as all of the ones you have grown up with. That's what they are about. That's part of what we'll be learning on this journey. And in the meantime, I introduced you to two people. Three videos I hope you looked at. 
So let's go back to a personal story. <laughs> um, Swami Satchidananda. Swami Satchidananda, going back to my story from last, the last lecture, found out I was adopted, went back to Cornell University, wondering who I was and what this was all about. And there'll be some filling in the gaps, suffice it to say, that a couple of years later, this is the 60s. Hey, I'm a product of the 60s. You watched the Woodstock guru, Swami Satchidananda, opened Woodstock. The 60s. You're studying it as history. I, I lived it. <laughs> I lived it. It was an era that was characterized by disillusionment. Disillusionment with, at the time, the Vietnam War. Disillusionment with our government and its pursuit of the Vietnam War. And the draft that took college students like me at the time into the army against our will to fight a war we didn't believe in. That's not the only disillusionment. Disillusionment with, I said government, disillusionment with materialism. You would need to understand about the 60s. The, the 60s, people were doing well. This is going to be really hard for you to relate to as students. You could go to college in the 60s, work a part-time, work, work a summer job over the summer, and graduate without any student debt. <laughs> any student debt. You could work in the, in the Catskills as a waiter uh, between tips and, your, and, your, uh, and your, your salary, go back to Cornell University and pay for your schooling for the rest of, for the whole year. Maybe work part-time. Uh, uh, there were some, some college jobs that you could put in a few hours a week on that reduced your tuition to what you could afford. People had jobs. You graduated from college and there was a line of employers waiting to interview you. You had to choose. You made appointments for them to see you. Hard to relate to, I know. <laughs> and yet, people weren't happy. Materialism that promised happiness was not delivering. The two-car garages were just another payment. It just wasn't totally working. Disillusionment with religion. That was another big issue in the 60s. It wasn't delivering either. I remember a headline in Time magazine, Is God Dead? Attendance was falling off in churches. Even more now, by the way. Attendance wasn't delivering. The disconnect, and what was one of the big disconnects? Birth control. 60s, the pill. We got the pill in the 60s. That liberated uh, a lot of people, and the church tried to fight against it, but I was trying to push back a gusher. Psychedelics. Psychedelics in the 60s. How can we not talk about the 60s and mention the psychedelics? LSD was legal. LSD was being studied in universities. The experience associated with it. Let me go back to 
there I was, Cornell University in the 60s. I began in 1965. I graduated with my MBA in 1970. Four years for the bachelor's, one extra year for the master's. A couple of years, within a couple of years after I'm sitting with this question of who am I, learning I was adopted, and a speaker came. Who was the speaker? It was Swami Satchitananda. It was before Woodstock. He was brought to the United States by the artist Peter Max. Back in the 60s, it was the Beatles. The Beatles discovered the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and brought him to the United, United States. And Peter Max discovered Swami Satchitananda. He went on a, he spoke at college campuses and he came to Cornell University. And I saw the poster and my girlfriend at the time, my wife today, still. In fact, a couple of months ago, Susan and I celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. We met at Cornell. We went to see Swami Satchitananda. We went to, we went to the lecture. And I don't mind telling you I was enthralled. I was open to it because I was open to just about anything in terms of what was going on in this world. And he was amazing. I, I, he, I don't know how well he came through to you. This is, this is a classic. Guru. We have that word in our society. We, we, we've adopted it. Guru is a Sanskrit term. We'll talk more about Sanskrit terms in the next lecture. Sanskrit is an ancient Indo-European language, the ancient language of India, the language of Hindu scriptures. The word guru is Sanskrit. It means teacher. In fact, here's what it really means. It's beautiful. It means dispeller of darkness. That's the translation of the word guru. To dispel ignorance. To be a teacher. This is how the teachings were handed down, especially to illiterate people way back when. This is a system that goes way back. We're talking about uh, uh, or the oral transmission of these teachings. I was enthralled. I said to Susan, I need to go to India. He was talking about yoga. I was in engineering school. To me, he was speaking my language in a spiritual and religious context. What was I learning in engineering? I was learning, I was in industrial engineering. I was learning how to make machines run efficiently, effectively. It's industrial. It's, it's the application of, of, of equipment and machinery to, to tasks and the production of materials. And he was talking about yoga as a way to make this machine function effectively and efficiently, to maintain it for an extended period of time. It was everything I was learning in engineering. And he was applying it to me. And I wanted to learn it. And he talked about something else. He talked about meditation. 
meditation, in effect, the yoga for the mind, the exercises for the mind, the practices for the mind. He was talking about clarity and seeing clearly. And I realized that's what business school was all about. In business school, those of you in business, ideally you are going to learn how to make good decisions. How to, how to deal with limited resources. How to allocate limited resources wisely. Clarity. Wisdom. Seeing the market as it is. If you read the market and you read it the way you think it ought to be and it's not the way it is, you, you are going to get into trouble. That's what business is about. Meeting people's needs, understanding their needs. Supplying them. Meditation was about clarity. About making good decisions. I wanted more. And here's the problem. There was no yoga in the United States. Today we had yoga. There's a yoga studio in, in, every, in every small town and sometimes every street corner. Back then there was none. It was underground. I said to Susan, we have to go to India. Yoga's in India. And we planned, and she was a good sport. <laughs> and we went. When we gra Susan was one year behind me. She graduated with a, her bachelor's when I finished that extra year for my, master, for my MBA. And we left for India on a one-way ticket. On a one-way ticket. <laughs> there are some sub-stories to this we're not going to get into. Let me simply say, uh, I just felt called. It was something I wanted to learn. We left. We had a plan. Oh, was it a bad plan? <laughs> so we had a plan. The plan was we'd go to India. I'd look up yoga in the yellow pages. We had yellow pages back then. You didn't find it in your phone. They yellow pages. You went to a hotel. Inside the, the drawer was the yellow pages. You could always find out what you needed in any town from the yellow pages. I thought we would go to India, we'd look up yoga in the yellow pages, and I would find a teacher, and it must be everywhere because, because it's Indian. I really totally naive. And, uh, and that was the plan. And that would have been a really bad plan. You could say fate intervened. Uh, I was at the Indian embassy in New York picking up our visas. And uh, we, were, we, we had our tickets, we were going, and uh, the woman in front of me in line, the clerk said to her, why are you going to India? And it wasn't private. She answered, traveling with Swami Satchidananda, the only name I knew from the lecture that turned me on at Cornell University. And I said to her, can I talk to you? And she said, of course. And I picked up our visas. And it turned out she was his personal secretary. And I said, can we join you? It turns out they were getting to India. Within a few days of us getting to India, I, we had to change one flight. It didn't cost anything at the time. It, Change the flight, and we joined them. There were only 10 of us. Swami Satchidananda, who opened Woodstock, 
that secretary that I met in the, in the Indian embassy, Susan and myself. This is a name some of you might know. Her name was Alice Coltrane. John Coltrane, the jazz musician, had passed away a year before. Alice was with us. Alice brought her harp all the way to India. Was also an anti war folk singer from the 60s. Her name was Laura Nero. She's not as famous as Joan Baez or Judy Collins, but they were, it was the big three. Laura Nero was right there, and what you don't even realize is Laura Nero wrote a lot, a lot of the songs. Laura wrote Save the Children, When I Die, Stone Soul Picnic. They were, they were just a, a she was inducted in the Rock Hall of Fame. Sorry to say, posthumously, she, she passed away in her 40s from cancer, and Susan and I lost a good friend. We, would, we spent the first month of our trip with Swami Satchidananda. And technically, we weren't in India. We were in Ceylon, which is an island off the coast of India, uh, in the hills of Kandy, Ceylon. It's now Sri Lanka. Uh, tea was known for tea, Ceylon tea, a tea plantation outside of Kandy, Ceylon, in the hills of in green, lush, elephants bathed in the river at the end of working in the jungle. Swami Satchidananda taught the ten of us yoga and meditation. We would practice all morning. After lunch, we were free. At dinner, we could ask him any question we had. After dinner, Alice would play her harp and Laura would sing. It was magical. It was a month that changed my life. The teachings. I'm not Hindu, by the way. The teachings. The wisdom. Stay with me today. Swami Satchidananda. This, by the way, is an album. He ended up, he is the cover. This is the classic cover of the Woodstock album. The back of Swami Satchidananda. This was an album. This, for the most part, it does, isn't happen to be of us, but this picture inside of Swami Satchidananda teaching a group of students is exactly what we experienced. At the end of the month, he was leaving to come back to the United States. We were staying. There was no yellow pages. Swami Satchidananda gave us a letter of introduction and a list of masters all over India. Susan and I traveled the length and breadth of India, studying with masters, yoga, meditation, Buddhism. He finally came back when we were literally saturated, ready. It was time. And when we came back, we learned about another teacher, the other one you met. So there was a little glitch <laughs> when we re viewed the video, uh, there was some lost, uh, the, the camera had cut out and then the camera came back and there was some lost audio. So um, I am uh, uh, finishing up this lecture in, it's, we're actually in my church, so uh, just uh, uh, apologize for that. I was talking about uh, my other teacher, and that was, uh, we were talking about Ramdas. You had that homework of watching the Ramdas video. 
And uh, I was starting to tell you about uh, a man by the name of Dr. Richard Alpert. Dr. Richard Alpert was a, a colleague of Timothy Leary at Harvard University back in the 60s doing research on LSD. And it was legal, legal research. They were, they were in the psychology department and uh, they were experimenting with LSD and experimenting with altered states of consciousness. And they got into it, needless to say, and uh, there, there are some great stories about how uh, they went to a wood, into the woods and uh, dropped acid every six hours for 10 days straight because they didn't want to come down. They always crashed. And that was a major bummer. And then what happened was that Timothy Leary continued his experimentation. Dr. Richard Alpert went to India. It was the 60s. The Beatles had brought, uh, had met the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Peter Max brought back Swami Satchidananda, the story I've just told you. And uh, Dr. Richard Alpert went to India and he met a master by the name of Neem Karoli Baba. And, and he, he went to India thinking, hearing that you could get high on meditation, high on yoga, uh, wanted to see what that was all about, but he brought some acid with him and he's sitting with Neem Karoli Baba. This is a great story. He says to Neem Karoli Baba, or Neem Karoli Baba says to him, you have power in your pocket, don't you? And Alpert thought he got caught with his pants down, and, uh, and Neem Karoli Baba said, give it to me, and he takes out about 10 hits of acid, and enough to choke a horse, and Neem Karoli Baba takes the acid, puts it all in his mouth at the same time. And to hear Richard Alpert tell this story, he's sweating, he's wondering how he's gonna get out of India, he just killed the guru, uh, how does he explain this to someone? And they sat there for six hours. And for the next six hours, Neem Karoli Baba, never changed. And Richard Alpert realized this man is not coming down. He's there. And it is in that moment that Dr. Richard Alpert, he calls it his transformation, he became a disciple of Neem Karoli Baba and took on the name Ramdas. That is who Ramdas is. He became a spokesman in the 60s and 70s and 80s, a spokesman for, for not needing drugs to get high, a spokesman for Hindu philosophy. You hear it in his, he, he brings it to the United States, in our language, in our, and, and, is, and he's so clever with it, and he mesmerizing. And I, I had the opportunity to study with him at many occasions. I've heard him tell that story about Neem Karoli Baba. It, uh, he sweats when he tells it again. Uh, uh, and he and I had a lot in common. He went to India. I went to India, we both went similar times. We have shared our stories on multiple occasions. Uh, Ramdas passed away about, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna be good on the time, I wanna say two years ago. He had had a stroke, hadn't been talking for probably the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, 
I spoke, a blue, there is a blue book. I now don't have it with me. I, I, it was sitting on the table <laughs> in the, in the, when, we, when we had the other video. The book is called Be Here Now. Be Here Now, the subtitle, The Transformation of Dr. Richard Alpert into Baba Ramdas, a Harvard psychologist studying Hindu philosophy, meeting a Hindu guru, becoming a spokesperson for yoga and meditation. I started this by telling you, don't get misled by the, by the, cart, by the comic book characters. This is a very sophisticated philosophy. We're going to begin diving into it. The homework for your next lecture, a walk through the Upanishads. It's only 12 minutes, but it will, it is likely to confuse you. It'll, it will lay out many of the things that I've told you is going to, uh, you're, you're going to find there. From atomic theory to theories of evolution to theories on form and matter. Watch it. I'm also asking you to read the introduction to the Bhagavad Gita uh, in your email. The, uh, you have the, uh, the website. Read the introduction, the setup, because much of this philosophy is presented in what, in what is called the Gita. So next lecture, we'll talk about source of scripture. We'll talk about uh, some of these, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about karma. Another one of those words that has entered our vocabulary. I'll explain it to you in the next lecture. Good luck with the homework. Enjoy your homework. Sorry for the end. Good enough. We're in good enough territory these days. <laughs> Have a great day.